meditation is supposed to work. It's supposed to make a difference in your mind. Helps you to be more patient, more equanimous. Strengthens your powers of mindfulness and concentration and discernment. It allows you to tap into sources of happiness and well-being that you might not be able to tap into otherwise. And yet often when you begin meditation, you're told that there is no such thing as good meditation or bad meditation, that you're not supposed to judge it. So how do you know that it works? Well, the reason you're told not to judge it at the beginning is because beginning meditators are notoriously poor judges of what's going on in their minds. When we start out, we do tend to be impatient, and we don't know how to read our minds. So you're given a method and told to stick with it. To trust in the process. But if the meditation is supposed to make you more patient, more discerning, there should come a point where you can read your own mind, where you're not too impatient. You begin to get a sense of what's going on. And after a while, you should be able to judge, is this working for you or not? So if it's not working, you can make changes. This is why the Buddha didn't teach just one method of meditation. You taught different methods, because different methods will work for different people. And also different methods will work for the same person at different times. He taught breath meditation as home base. In other words, he didn't want you to be a dilettante just going around from method to method as the mood struck you. He wanted you to put the mind in a place where it can look at itself. And the breath is a good place to do that, because the breath is very intimate with the mind. Of the different processes in your body, the one that's closest to the functioning of the mind is the breath. Greed arises in the mind, anger, fear. And it's going to immediately have an effect on the breath, and then that spreads to other aspects of the body as well. And at the same time, the breath gives you something to play with. You can experiment with different kinds of breathing to see what impact they have on the mind. So sometimes the breath is not only the way of making you sensitive to the mind, but also it gives you tools for dealing with the mind, putting it back in shape when you find that it's out of shape. When the mind is feeling down, sometimes just some good deep in and out breathing. Think of the breath going to different parts of the body. It can waken you up, freshen you up. Put the mind in a much better mood. When the mind needs steadying, you can breathe down into your feet, down into your hands. That seems to transfix the mind into the body. But there are times when the breath on its own is not enough, which is why the Buddha taught other methods as well. When he taught his son, Rahula, how to meditate, he gave him ten different methods in addition to the breath. How to get the mind to settle down and be more patient, resilient. How to replace thoughts of ill will with good will, cruelty with compassion, resentment with empathetic joy, and irritation and aversion with equanimity. How to contemplate the body so as to overcome feelings of lust. 
and how to watch the inconstancy of everything in body and mind as a way of undercutting the conceit that you are this or you are that. So the Buddha didn't have Rahula depend just on the breath. At the same time, he taught him ways of learning how to judge what needs to be done. Part of this has to do with the teachings on karma. When I first went to practice meditation with Ajahn Fu, there were a lot of different Buddhist teachings that I was curious and uncertain about, and I'd ask him about them. And One day he finally said, look, there's only one thing you have to believe to meditate, and that's karma. In other words, you are responsible for your actions, and the quality of your intentions is going to make a difference. But you have to understand that karma is not the deterministic kind of teaching that many people think it is. And understanding karma helps you un to understand and to read your own mind. What you're experiencing right now is a combination of two sorts of things, results of past actions past intentions, as they're sprouting right now in the present, and the results of your intentions and actions right now. Which means that when something comes up in the meditation, it might be the result of what you're doing right now, and it might be the result of something you did in the past. So you have to learn how to read that. Sometimes people start meditating and they uncover all kinds of things coming up in their mind, and they blame the meditation. And it may simply be that the time has come for that particular past action to sprout right now, and the meditation allows you to see it, whereas otherwise you might run away from it. So it's not the fault of the meditation, say, that there's anger suddenly appearing in your mind, or greed, or lust, or fear. So you have to alert yourself to that issue. That You have to be sensitive to this. Is it does it come from what you're doing right now, or does it come from the past? This is why you have to meditate again and again to test a particular technique in different situations. If you begin to see that every time you meditate it does tend to stir up certain thoughts, maybe that's not the meditation for you, especially if it doesn't give you a way of counteracting or separating yourself from those thoughts. There was a case of some monks in the time of the Buddha who were doing contemplation of the body, and they got so disgusted with their bodies that they started committing suicide and hiring assassins to kill themselves. The Buddha found out about this, called the remaining monks together, and said, Look, when unskillful mental states arise in the mind, go back to the breath. This breath meditation helps clear those unskillful states out of the mind in the same way that the first rains of the rain season clear all the dust out of the air. So it is possible that even a good meditation technique, if misapplied, can cause problems. So on the one hand, be sensitive to where a particular thought is coming from. Is this something just popping into the mind, or is it a result of what you're doing right now? One rule of thumb is if a thought simply pops into the mind, that's probably the result of past karma. What you do in response to that thought, that's present karma. That's a good rule of thumb to start out with. You'll find things are a little bit more complex as you get into them, but it's a good place to start. Another important understanding about karma is that there's skillful karma and unskillful karma. Skillful karma leads to a sense of well-being that causes no harm, either for yourself or for other people. It doesn't take anything away from them. It doesn't lead to increased greed, anger, and delusion in your own mind. And it's important to understand that skillful karma, is not the, which is a skillful intention, is not the same thing as a good intention. Good intentions are well-meaning, but they may be unskillful. They might be based on misunderstanding. Or they may be larded with denial. 
In other words, what seems to be a good intention may simply be sheep's clothing under over something else. And the only way you're going to read that is by looking at the results of your intentions. This is why meditation is a kind of experimentation. You do something and you watch for the results. Then you do it again, watch for the results again. Then you change things a little bit, see if you get different results. Make comparisons. Now this does depend on the fact that you're beginning to get more patient and more sensitive to what's going on in the body and the mind. And that you're truthful with yourself. The Buddha once said that was the primary prerequisite for learning the Dharma, is that you're truthful, both with other people and with yourself. So when you have these qualities of patience and truthfulness, which hopefully you've developed through the meditation, you're in a much better position to read what's going on and decide for yourself what's working and what's not. But at the same time, keep those two principles of karma in mind. Sometimes what you're experiencing is a result of past karma, which you can't do much about. And sometimes it's a result of what you're doing right now which you can do something about. And that's what the meditation is all about. It's your karma in the present experimenting with different ways. Of dealing with pleasure, different ways of dealing with pain, to see what give what approaches give the best results. And over time as a meditator, your powers of judgment should get more and more precise in this way. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha included evaluation as part of right concentration. And you can start with something simple like the breath. You breathe in certain ways and notice the effect that it has on the body, the effect it has on the mind. And try breathing other ways, see what effect you get. And you notice that different ways of breathing are good in different situations. The body will have different breath needs even in the course of a single day. And this is an ideal way of sensitizing yourself to what you're doing and the results of what you're doing right now. Which is why of all the steps in breath meditation, the adjustment of the breath, working with the different breath energies in the body, this is the one that takes the most time and also gives you the most lessons, something you can play with for your whole life. Keep learning new things about breath energy, new things about how the breath relates to the mind, the mind relates to the breath, as you experiment and play. And John Sawat used to say, meditation isn't something you just play with. And John Vuong said, you've got to play with it. And they're talking about two different things. John Swart was saying this sort of desultory, just playing around without any purpose. That doesn't get you anywhere. And John Fuhr was talking about playing with a purpose, experimenting, exploring, trying to figure out what's most skillful. That kind of playing develops your powers of judgment, develops your powers of discernment, starting with the breath and then moving into the mind. And as those powers of discernment get more developed, you are in a better and better position to see that there is such a thing as good meditation and there is such a thing as a bad meditation session. And you've got the understanding and the patience and the truthfulness to become a better and better judge of when the meditation is working and when it's not and what to do when it's not.
So on the one hand, don't be too quick to judge your meditation. But on the other hand, try to develop the skills that will make you a reliable judge. So your judgments are not judgmental, but they're actually informative, helpful. and become an aid on the path.